All right, so uh, practical things that we were talking about while I get the slides going. Um, so we don't have to decide this today, um, but it, we kind of have two options for how to approach the, the test next week. We can either do the test on Tuesday during lab. We don't have to take it in lab. There's only three of you. We can arrange to take it wherever, do it in the library or, or SAS, et cetera. Um, so you know, probably even in one of these classrooms, I bet they're empty during our lab time. Um, hey, Lex. Um, if we did it on, if we did the test on Thursday, that would give you more time to prepare next Thursday, not two days from now. That would give you more time to prepare, but we probably, I would probably try to squeeze in a little more material because otherwise it's a whole lot of dead time between now and then. Um, so would you rather do the test earlier on less material or later on more material? There's there later on more material. How do we feel about that? I kind of wanted to do it Tuesday, but I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine with I'm totally fine either way. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have a strong preference. Yeah. Uh, if it, if someone else has a higher, stronger preference, I'll defer. Um, and what I was saying to them too, Lex, is that is that we after today's lecture and, and maybe Thursdays, if we don't get through everything today, um, we will have already covered all the stuff that I normally cover before midterm. So we're just ahead of schedule because of the lack of snow days and, and we've been going quick. Um, so that was the choice is we could do the, the standard would be to move it up two days and we can either do it during the lecture time or the lab time on Tuesday or then or we could do it on Thursday. So you don't have to decide right now. So it'll either be. I'm thinking, you know, next if we keep the test on Tuesday of next week, we'll do a review session or just say office hours next Tuesday morning, and then the test during the lab time slot. Okay. Is everybody on board with that then? Do it one to four next Tuesday. Um, I'll still aim it for being a two hour test. I'm not going to lengthen the test, but that you have three hours available. So as long as you start it by two, um, and then you've got your own schedule. Yeah, I'll I'll just walk over after class and then go schedule okay. it with them and just tell them that like you'll drop off the. Yeah, yeah, I'll have the test over there before before we start lecture on Tuesday. Okay, cool. Um, cool. So that's plan on doing that. So then Thursday will be kind of you know finishing up lecture, maybe working on some NMR stuff um, that wouldn't be on the test, but finishing up sort of the the lab that we're doing this week because the NMR um, aspect of it is kind of tricky. For Thursday, Tuesday morning will be a review. Tuesday afternoon will be the test. Reasonable? Yeah. Sounds good. Do you yeah. think, um, like, will we get like the practice test again this week? Yeah, I have that ready to go. In fact, let me let me pull up the um, the Canvas shell. I think that assignment is actually already posted. Oh, cool. Um, which was my first clue that that we had a test coming up. <laughs> is that last year? We did that assignment this time. In the lab from last week, or we still going to talk about the NMR? Yeah, we're going to do the NMR. We're going to work on that aspect. We're going to do the purification. We'll, we'll try a sublimation after we get a... a our initial results. Um, we'll try, we'll finish getting it as distilled as we can, getting it as dry as we can, get a yield, and then we'll try sublimation and then we'll talk about NMR. So we're just finishing up last week's lab today. So it won't be due until you know, Friday at the earliest. The, uh, the write up, I mean. I have to say, it, it is kind of nice being ahead of schedule because I don't feel like I'm. You constantly late for things as much. All right. Uh, let's double check that this is in fact going. So 
the homework practice test is posted. It'll be due next Tuesday. I'll change the um the due date on it to be. I usually always make the practice test due the day of the test because there's no point in making due after that, right? Um, since the point is to prepare. All right, so some nomenclature stuff, alkenes, alkynes for nomenclature. Remember your R's and S's. Um, and then the reverse, if I give you the name, draw me the structure, give me the formula. So all just like the other tests we've had for this class so far, right? Looks a lot like the final, just new functional groups. Classify everything as primary, secondary, tertiary, since that's still important. Um, I'm give you a word bank and you have to try and, and apply it to the molecules. Okay, what section of which of these molecules is, is um, a phenyl group? Which one is a benzylic carbon? So basically just know how this word bank of words, and it'll be the same words, um, know how they apply. I'll, what I'll do is I'll just switch out what the molecules are. Okay, what's that? Aliphatic? Aliphatic means um, basically alkane, means no resonance, no pi bonds. So like we'd call these two would both be allylic, yeah. but this would be aliphatic. So there's no functional? No resonance, no functional groups, no pi bonds. Um, we wouldn't technically call this one aliphatic because it has the resonance, makes it behave differently than just pure alkane. So it's like, think of it as like an, an insulated alkane, an alkane that's away from any possible resonance. Um, so these two would be aliphatic up here. And I'm not, and for these ones, it doesn't matter that you find all of the aliphatic carbons. You could, um, if you do, maybe that's worth a point or two of extra credit if you manage to find all of the aliphatic and um, don't mix it up or anything, but I'm really just saying find an example of an aliphatic carbon for each of these. You know, here's your aromatic carbon. So you've got your aromatic, aliphatic. There's there's a third molecule down below um, that is uh, that has an enol. Actually, it doesn't have an enol. Um, oh, so some terms. Some terms may not be used, and some terms may be used more than once. So basically the way I would approach this is just go through every carbon and you know go down the list. Is it now halide, aldehyde, epoxide, et cetera? Go to, and then cross it off when it's not, if it is or if it isn't. Um, or not cross it off because you might use it again, but use you know as many as you can for each of the molecules. And then is the exam going to be broken up differently? Like, because usually it's 10 points, but that one's a six, so I didn't know. So, um, yeah, with, with OCHEM, I do that with GenChem because it tends to have lots of nice, neat chunks. Right. Um, OCHEM, there are some sections that I want to be worth more, like the reactions is going to be 40 points, um, and that's going to be 10 reactions. So it's you know, four points per reaction. So it will be a little bit different, but the points are all laid out on the practice test the same way that they will be. Um, if there are any changes to how the points are distributed, it'll be pretty minor. Yeah, okay. I never want to lock myself into saying that they'll be exactly the same yeah. because I might, I might realize, remember, oh wait, we did this last year and it didn't work. Um, and But for the most part, it's not dramatically different. So. 70 of the points are reactions and mechanisms. The other 30 are going to be vocab stuff, basic conceptual stuff. And, and so 10 points each for the mechanisms. And then the wild, the wild card question is going to be a synthesis problem. So how do we put these together in a way Um, and in this case, I actually said, here's a new mechanism you haven't seen before. How could, you, and then how can you use that to make this molecule? So that was the wild card aspect of it is you haven't seen this mechanism before. 
but here it is. Does that help you make this molecule? Um, and I don't remember. I'm I'm reserving the right to do that. I may or may not actually have a totally new mechanism for you presented on the fly. But if I do, it'll be something of where I'm not testing you on the mechanism. I'm just saying, here's a new reaction for your synthesis toolbox. Can you use it right? All right, so that assignment is posted. Wrong button. Um, and I'll put the due date on now that we decided the test will be next Tuesday. This will be due next Tuesday as well. So you'll have the rest of this week and the weekend and next Tuesday morning to finish this this up. So the access is still high. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. And while I'm at it, I might as well, while I'm thinking about it, so I don't forget it later, I might as well change the due date. That's all good. That's all good. And just to just so everybody's thinking about the timing, right? Nobody has any other midterms next Tuesday that that's going to conflict with or anything. Your Tuesdays are pretty much OCHEM. Yeah. Because you've got yeah. 10 to 10 to 4 basically is OCHEM. So. All right. Then uh, let's talk about. Is that not the minimize? Oh, it's, here we go. All right, so some good questions on the quiz about radical reactions. Um, so what is it about bromination? And actually, both of these. These two are tied. The first and third question are tied together. Why is it that radical bromination favors the tertiary positions, despite the fact that it's more sterically hindered and despite the fact there's so many other primary hydrogens? Um, and that is the key difference between chlorination and bromination is that bromination being I don't think it's quite endothermic. One of the steps is endothermic. I think it's minus 30 instead of minus 100 kilojoules per mole for the overall process. But that is a different enough in terms of uh, those that hydrogen abstraction that basically bromination won't pull off a primary hydrogen if there's a tertiary hydrogen. It favors the, it slows it down enough that the bromination will only pick its favorite Whereas chlorination will pick whatever's closest. Chlorine has no standards. Bromine has very high standards when it comes to this process. And that's why one tertiary hydrogen that is still sterically hindered is more, is a better target, is more, is the primary target for a bromination. But chlorine will take whatever it can get. And so chlorine, you get a wide range of, like, yes, it goes a lot faster. Yes, it goes under conditions that bromine would be too slow to use. Um, you know, I don't think you can do a bromination of methane because a methyl radical, continuing that, that trend, it's so hard to abstract a hydrogen from methane because it leaves you with a methyl radical. So you, we chlorinate methane because one, there's only one hydrogen it can grab anyway, and two, it makes it fast enough. So that's why we have dichloromethane instead of dibromomethane as a solvent. Um, but for anything else where we want to favor just our most favorable product, bromine basically will make that the major product every time. Like a bigger, bigger, greater difference in energy between- Exactly, different exactly. Energies. Um, and then, Lex, that was a really good question on, on the alkynes. From everything I can find, which is 
far from an exhaustive search. I just spent five minutes Googling it and checking the textbook. Um, there's nothing to indicate that an alkyne is going to react differently than an alkene with these reactions. Um, so you're still going to, if you do NBS plus an alkyne, you're still going to, to brominate in the allylic position. Um, you can still do an anti-Markovnikov um, addition for, for a single bromine if you do it with one equivalent, as far as I can tell. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not something that shows up in the standard textbooks. If it's, it's, I'm sure it's been studied, but it's probably just not been written up in textbooks, at least at the 200 level. Yeah, I was, I was like, when I get questions at this point where I, where I have to go do research to figure out what the answer is. So good job. All right. Um, and did everybody, everybody notice that the quiz over the weekend was the same problem that we finished lecture with? I started the quiz first and then I started to finish the video. I was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, I didn't realize when we actually got, when we worked our way through that, but I didn't do it in too much detail. So there's still, I'll still go through it, but I would assume that everybody didn't have too much trouble with this, with parts B and C. A was the trickiest step. And then once you have that, it's just reaction problems, right? All right. Well, then here is one of the places where we caught up is that we still had, last time I taught this in 2022, um, we still had a whole half a lecture of free radical mechanisms to cover when we got to this lecture. Um, so we get to spend more time on the synthesis part than, than we did before, which is good because that's synthesis problems are great review because it kind of incorporates all of the reactions we've talked about so far. And be, they're the trickiest conceptually because you have to be thinking three steps ahead. Um, it's a little bit like playing chess versus playing tic-tac-toe. Uh, so, when we're talking about these synthesis problems, it's generally helpful to break up the, the steps that you might need to, to use into two different um, categories. And the way that these are usually classified is you either have functional group transformations, which is when you change one functional group to another functional group, but you don't change the carbons themselves. You, the carbons all stay where they are. And then, which leads to the second category, which are the much more, much less common reactions. Uh, we don't have very many options to change the carbon skeleton, right? So we're going to go through their basic categories and kind of reframe our functional group transformations instead of just being, here's our chapter on alkenes. It's, we're going to reframe it as here is the process that allows you to move a pi bond from, from these two carbons to that, those two carbons. It's the same reactions we've talked about before. We're just shifting our goal instead of just predicting what happens into using that. Um, and so there are sort of three subcategories that we have so far. Um, if we want to move a halogen, we typically go through an elimination reaction followed by an addition reaction. If we control the conditions, we can control what type of elimination we get. Do we get the Hoffman or the Zaitsev product, right? And then if, if we then follow it up with an addition reaction where we control whether we get the Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, that allows us to move things around pretty well. We're st we still have limitations. It's not like we can just pick a carbon at random and say, I'm moving it to that carbon, but it gives us a lot of flexibility. It kind of gives us at least a three carbon range where we could put a halogen, um, depending on the molecule. And then if we want to move where a pi bond is, we do the opposite. Instead of elimination followed by addition, we do addition and then another elimination. And once again, controlling those conditions 
Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, Zaitsev versus Hoffman allows us to determine where we're going to put that pi bond, where are we moving that pi bond. Um, and then we can move back and forth between single, double, and triple bonds too. Um, we can take an alkene and turn it into an alkyne. We can take an alkyne and we can turn it to an alkene. Uh, we can take an alkene and we can turn it to an alkane. Right, so those different types of functional groups are going to, and what's left off in here too is, is substitution reactions. If we have a halogen and we want it to be a hydroxide, we can do a, um, a substitution reaction. And right, so that kind of is, would be the fourth category here of, of functional group transformations. Um, so we'll go through and we'll do some examples of, of how we can think about these. But in more detail, here's if we're trying to move a halogen. So let's say we're starting with 3-methyl-2-bromo-butane. Three, three if we go through an elimination reaction, we can move the bromine to the tertiary carbon, or we can move the bromine to the primary carbon. And once we move the bromine to the tertiary carbon, if we wanted to put it on that primary carbon, we could do that as well, right? So it might mean doing this process more than once, but it, it does, it, with the right molecule, it does mean we can move, eventually move the bromine, the halogen, pretty much wherever we want it. Um, unless we wind up with, with a really big molecule where we wind up with, with um, a, you know, a secondary carbon on either side of your bromine, that's going to be really hard to do that specifically one direction versus the other if they're energetically the same. Um, we can still do it, but we're going to be limited to about a 50% yield because we kind of have a 50-50 chance, which do I make the, the two butene or the three butene with that elimination step? All right, so if we wanted to, if we wanted to do this process, the one that's shown here to put it on the bromine, what type of elimination, we start with elimination, we want the Zaitsev or the Hoffman product? We want the Zaitsev product, which means do we, what kind of base do we use? Sterically hindered or a small base? Small base. So something like hydroxide, probably don't want to use hydroxide necessarily because we want to avoid the substitution side product or side reaction. Um, yeah, so we, we're going to pick our reagents so that we get the Zaitsev product. And then our, for our addition, we want Markovnikov or anti? Yeah, Markovnikov is the standard, is the put it on the more substituted carbon. So if we do a Zaitsev elimination followed by a Markovnikov hydrobromination, that puts the bromine all the way on the right, or sorry, on the tertiary carbon. So a lot of times, a lot of textbooks have different versions of the same figure. Um, and they can be very overwhelming. There's some of them, you know, compound chemistry um, has those really nice, well-designed um, figures for a lot of different for a lot of different uh, um, things like, like NMR and IR spectra and things like that. They're, they have what they consider, call it a subway map of um, synthesis processes. It tends to be a little bit overwhelming because they put even more about the, the re reaction conditions, like at what temperature in what solvent for each of these. And so it winds up looking a little bit too intense at this point. Um, it's really helpful if you actually live in that world and do organic synthesis to just have that all laid out in front of you. Um, and we'll we'll look at it here in a second. But in general, this has all of our information for moving a halogen around. If we use sodium ethoxide as our base, we get the Zaitsev product. If we use HBr from the Zaitsev product, we get the Markovnikov addition. If we use anti-Markovnikov addition from the Zaitsev product, we went back to where we started. 
we do a sterically hindered base, we get the less substituted, we get the Hoffman product. And from there, we can do the anti-Markovnikov product with the bromine on the primary carbon. And if we started with the bromine on the primary carbon and we wanted to put it on the secondary, we would go through an elimination. And then from the elimination, there should be another you know, reverse arrow here. If you did, if we just did hydrobromic addition here, we'd go backwards this way, right? All right, so this is, like I said, a lot of information in a really compact way, but it's it can be helpful to think about these, um, these synthesis processes as basically moving you from one point to another on a map. If we're going to do these successive reactions, you just have to be able to navigate on the map, just like if you're making a road trip with more than one stop, just plan where your stops are going to be, right? I have it saved on my Dropbox somewhere, but I think this will be faster. So they even call it a map in this case. Graphically, it looks a lot like a tube map or something like that, right? This is more complete, more complete than what we've been talking about before. You see what I mean about how it has not just the reagents, but also the conditions with it. It makes it look like a lot. This will be really helpful once we get to, um, once we've talked about all these different various functional groups. Once we cover carboxylic acids and derivatives, being able to remember how to get from an acid anhydride to an ester um, or from an ester to a carboxylic acid and then back to an alcohol allows us to do, to do all of these different functional group conversions. Um, but really, this is most helpful in terms of, like it says at the top, functional group conversions. This this is once you get your bromide where you want it, then this is really helpful because you can say, okay, a halo alkane. I'm starting here. How I'm how am I going to get to a carboxylic acid? Well, I can go halo alkane to an alcohol, alcohol to a carboxylic acid. But mainly, what I want to point out with that one is the. It's just the way that these complicated looking schemes are really just a map as a way to, can, to put multiple steps in a row together. Remind you how the reactions work. Um, we can also move an alcohol. If we started with an alcohol instead of a halide, uh, the trick, though, is that alcohols don't go through elimination reactions very well. They do addition reactions to make alcohols work pretty well. Right? And then we have lots of flexibility with the hydroboration or the oxymercuration um, to, to do those hydration reactions. But if we want to first start by going through an elimination, we have to make that OH a better leaving group. And so I, and we talked about this a little bit when we back when we did substitution and elimination reactions, right? That OTS, that tosylate, is basically just a, is a sulfur attached to a benzene ring, a, a sulfonate ester attached to a benzene ring. It's a really good leaving group. Um, but it's pretty easy to convert a hydroxide, a bad leaving group, into a good leaving group if with the right uh, reagents. So the same map for moving an alcohol around, an oxygen around, just has multiple steps here. You need the tosyl chloride and pyridine and then the sodium ethoxide to go through the elimination reaction. If you're doing the anti, or uh, the um, Hoffman product for the elimination, you still need the tosyl chloride and pyridine and then your sterically hindered base. So same reactions, in general, it's still eusterically hindered base or non sterically hindered base. You just have this step one to make it a better leaving group first. Um, and then 
once you get to the alkenes, you can then turn those alkenes back into alcohols, either doing the Markovnikov or the anti-Markovnikov process. We so take the pulsolate chlorine again. It's with this sulfur in there. Or? I believe. I believe, if I'm remembering the structure right. So this is the tosyl chloride. Um, this half the molecule doesn't really matter that much. What happens when you put this molecule with an alcohol is the chlorine gets replaced with the, the oxygen from the alcohol. So you attach this whole group to where the hydrogen was attached on the alcohol. And then when that, once you do that, you wind up with something that's a much better leaving group. So here's your tosylate group. This is what we turned our alcohol into. And then all of this, everything in blue is a good leaving group which means it's really ripe for a, a elimination reaction then. So we're basically, you replace the chlorine that was attached here with third oxygen from the alcohol. And then when that molecule breaks apart, the O oxygen from the alcohol goes with the tosyl globe group. So it extracts the oxygen. Exactly, exactly. Um, but from the point of view, if, if the molecule we care about is the R group here, we don't usually draw this whole thing and we don't think of it as extracting the oxygen so much as making a better leaving group in the same position. And it, and it will also preserve the stereochemistry. If your oxygen was in, not that it really matters if we're going to then go through an elimination um, because we turn everything into sp2 once we do that anyway. Um, but we effectively, you know, just make it so, okay, now we can make it's. The net result is we make an alcohol into a leaving group. The uh, order we had like a lab where we like protonated alcohol. Group. That's another good way to do that. If you protonate an alcohol, that makes it a good leaving group too. Because now you have, a, instead of having a hydroxide attached, you have a water molecule attached. If you change your point of view to think about the leaving group. Water is a much weaker base, which means it's also a better leaving group. Um, this is just even more effective than that with fewer side reactions, because if you if you put an alcohol in acidic conditions and then have it go through an elimination, you also have, it makes it harder to make that alkene because remember acid catalyzed hydration, you basically are, are making a, a reversible process. You're making an equilibrium reaction if you do it with, with um, an acid. This is an irreversible elimination reaction. Yeah, I mean, it technically is, but it favors the elimination product so much more completely. Yeah. But yeah, it's the exact same logic that we did before. Um, and that's why we... But since we don't really care about the tosyl group beyond it makes it a good leaving group, we just abbreviate it as TS, just like we would with a methyl or an ethyl have that abbreviated form. All right, so, and again, there's not really anything new on this page, right? Um, we could, the fact, I don't know, other than the fact that they wanted to show both of them, so that, I don't know why it's glitchy when I do that. We'll switch to the pen. Um, they use the oxymercuration to do the Markovnikov hydration here, but they just do, did acid catalyzed up here. You could also use the acid catalyzed oxymercuration for that top step too. You have to use the, for this particular molecule, 
we're using this sort of just as a model. This the same logic applies no matter what the rest of this molecule is. Um, but if we want to make sure that it doesn't go through a rearrangement, we would have to choose whether it's acid catalyzed or oxymercuration. Um, so for this molecule, we couldn't use acid catalyzed to go back here because we would get too much of the re rearrangement product. Um, but we could just as easily use the oxymercuration up in the, that top right corner of this map as well. Most cases, especially if you're making a tertiary product, um, you don't really need to pick between the oxymercuration or the acid catalyzed. They should both be able to work. Although, as we learned last week, there are some rearrangements themselves can get a little bit weird, right? We expected that norbornene to be able to rearrange um, by doing acid catalyzed hydration, and it doesn't because it's norbornene and has the weird sterics. Um, which, now that I think about it, I think we can explain that pretty well based on the shapes of the orbitals because you don't have the free rotation. No, we'll save that for lab. We'll talk about that lot more in lab. All right, so that's how we can move a functional group. Alcohols and halides are both pretty easy to move around. Specifics differ a little bit. Um, if we wanted to try and avoid using borane and or mercury, we might start with a halide, move the halide where we wanted it, and then turn the halide into a hydroxide instead of moving an alcohol around um, if we had that option. But we can do both. If we want to move a pi bond, we just switch the order of the steps. We're starting with something with a pi bond. We want to move the pi bond. We start with the addition and then follow up with the elimination instead of the other way around. So for the molecule shown here, for the addition, we want Markovnikov or anti. Right, we want to put the bromine on the more substituted carbon. So, and then we so we follow up a Markovnikov addition with Zaitsev or Hoffman elimination. Hoffman, right? So the map for the for moving a pi bond looks pretty similar. And in this case, we could we might as well stick to using a halogen for our intermediate. It doesn't really matter. We could use an OH, but then we have to use the tosyl chloride to make it a better leaving group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is another case of when in doubt, use a halogen as your intermediate. If you have yeah, if you get to choose where your starting point is might as well, it's a lot easier to work with halogens moving around than it is with alcohols. Is that because they're better leaving groups? Or... They're better leaving groups, yeah. Um, I guess the, the corollary to that is you might not be able to do that if you're worried about rearrangement happening because our hydrobromination was based on um, and just an acid catalyzed mechanism. Um, so you might have to use an OH group if you tr are trying to prevent um, a, a rearrangement. But in general, at, we either have Markovnikov addition or anti Markovnikov addition, and then we have Zaitsev or Hoffman. We mix and match them as, as needed. All right, last, last um, case of converting 
or moving around our functional groups. So if we want to change the number of pi bonds. And really, we could add an additional one here. If you want to go from an alkyne to an alkene, we can use that poison catalyst or the dissolving metal reaction to get the cis versus the trans. So, Lindler's catalyst would give us the cis. Dissolving metal reaction would give us the trans, but either way, we have we have a pretty foolproof way of converting an alkyne to an alkene. We also have a pretty um, pretty good way of converting an alkene to an alkyne. It's just a multi-step process. If we want to convert an alkene to an alkyne, making an alkyne, we had to do a double elimination, right? So the easiest way to set it up to have to do a double elimination is to have two, have two bromides. And the easiest way to do that is take an alkene and you do a dibromination to it. So you just do this reaction in bromine or with bromine. That's going to take the alkene and turn it to a bromine on each carbon. And then you just do the, our standard expose it to sodium amide and then water to neutralize it at the end. So we're somewhat limited here in terms of this, if we use the excess sodium amide, it's going to preferentially make the terminal alkyne. It's not necessarily going to be able to keep it in the same spot, um, but we do have a way to go back and forth between these. And sometimes that is something we want. If we want to put our pi bond all the way at the end of a carbon chain, this might be a more effective way of moving a pi bond than those the uh, reactions from the slide before, because you could do it all in one process. Because remember that excess sodium amide forces the double pi bond, the alkyne bond, at to the end of a carbon chain so that it can deprotonate it as well. And then if we were looking at going the other direction, if we wanted to take an alkene and make and make an alkane, that's our classic hydrogenation, right? which also works with alkynes. You just need two equivalents of hydrogen over a platinum instead of over Lindler's catalyst. This quote down at the bottom is also a good thing to keep in mind. If you're starting with an alkane, you don't have any functional groups to work with, right? So the very first thing you need to do is to give yourself a functional group you can work with. So almost always, if your starting material is an alkane, you're going to start by doing radical hydrogen or um, halogenation. And depending on where you and which usually means bromination, because then you can predict where the bromine is going to go. But if there are some cases where all of your carbons are equivalent to each other, like if you're starting with cyclohexane, it doesn't really matter if you do bromination or chlorination, right? Because all of those carbons are identical. They're all secondary. They're all the same. No matter where you put it, you're going to get one chloro or one bromo cyclohexane. Um, so, but in general, bromination is going to be your more selective. And in, in synthesis, we usually want more selective because that's going to give us higher yields overall. You do like one product instead of many. Right. It's which limits how much you lose when you then have to go through purification steps. The one case where you might not want that is if you're trying to put a halogen on, on a primary carbon, you might want to take what you could consider the shotgun approach, the scattergun approach of just chlorinate at random. And, you know, a third of your product is going to be the primary chloride. If that's a better yield than going through bromine, the tertiary, and then move the bromine and then move the bromine. There are 
times where you would want it, you would try it both ways and see which one experimentally gave you a better yield. Technically, like purifying a primary from a secondary, is that difficult or? Depends on the rest of the molecule a little bit because they are going to have different boiling points, but they'll be close. So it'll it'll depend a little bit on how well you could distill them. Um, other maybe you know solubility issues, but yeah, purification is a problem because when you do a purification, you lose yield without even going through a, a reaction, right? So usually we want to limit our number of purification steps the same way we want to limit our number of reactions if we're trying to maximize our yield. Your yields like kind of multiply and then together each step. Like you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, on the recording it we talked about that. But basically the anytime you've got multiple steps, if you've got you know 70% yield followed by a 60% yield, followed by a 95% yield versus a two-step process where it's 80% yield and then a 90% yield. Well, 80 times 0.8 times 0.9 is gonna be 72%, right? Versus 70% times 60%, even though there's a 95% yield step in there, 70% times 60% is only going to give you, what, 42%, I think. And then 95% of 42. So usually the fewer steps you can do, the better. And we would also want to include our purification steps in there. Right, because purification is going to have its own yield associated with each of those steps. When we do a distillation, we only get you know 80% yield or something like that, 85% yield. So that has its own cost. All right, so let's do a practice. We went through a bunch of these. If we're trying to take molecule on the left, and convert it to the molecule on the right. What steps would we use? So this one's three steps. Not too bad though, right? Start with your, this This really shows the power of, of doing successive 
versions of the same step. You start with an anti-Markov-Nikov hydrobromination and then Hoffman elimination and then another anti-Markov-Nikov hydrobromination. That allows us to move that bromine not just one spot away, we got it all the way to the primary carbon by doing that. If we'd started with the bromine on the tertiary carbon, we would have just started with an elimination. If we, if we wanted to end with an alcohol, then wherever it's convenient, we switch from doing hydrobromination to doing a hydration. We could have, if we wanted the primary alcohols of our final product, we still could have done hydrobromination for the first step. And then when we get to the last step, we switch the, the uh, hydroboration, the anti markov nikov hydration, right? So we get to mix and match. Just because you started with the bromine doesn't mean you have to stay with the bromine the whole way through. Whenever it gets convenient, you switch over to the other functional group. Um, but in general, bromides are easier to work with. The reactions are pretty high yield and the react reagents are not toxic, nothing to, dangerous about, I mean, hydrobromic acid is still pretty dangerous, but not like oxymercuration. Um, and it's a one-step reaction as opposed to those oxymercuration, demercuration. That's really two reactions in one, right? Which means they're each going to have their own yield issues, right? Plus then you you made mercury and now you have to deal with getting rid of the mercury. And so overall, that's, that's the general process with these synthesis is, okay, sometimes you're going to be able to see it. This one was not a particularly tricky one to see the steps, right? Um, sometimes you need to work backward from where you're trying to go because if you can work backward, okay, what reaction, what molecule would I have to start from to make my final product? And then you can say, okay, well, now how do I make this molecule that's one step away from my final product? And you can try to, you just successively work backward until you get to your starting material, um, which is the, the approach to that is, is called retrosynthetic analysis. And it does have its own set of arrows that we I think I've mentioned before. Um, but I don't like using the retrosynthetic arrows because I think that complicates things. I just work from right to left if I'm going backward. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after, and we'll talk about changing the carbon structures and do some more practice. Yeah. We started recording, but I didn't start the screen share. Oh. We'll start that now. It's okay. I didn't use the screen very much until yeah. until Just this that. last slide. Yeah. So.
I think we'll start making flashcards. Yeah. I feel like that'll be best. Yeah. Oh, I just like remembering. It's like the the Markov and the Zaytsev shit's fine, but the, like the reactants, like, oh, oh yeah, what does that do again? <laughs> like, I like remember the mechanics too, especially the like for exploration. Yeah. Like that. I only kind of I was like stressing them last night and I like was like going over drawing it and I'm like I don't think I could do this from memory after looking at it for an hour last night. Like I still can't do this. Like it's like there's that weird transition state that like moves. There's like a hydroxyl shift or a hydride shift in there, it, like repositions the uh, okay, we'll get through it together. <laughs> yeah. If we all vomit, then hopefully there's a curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's just like, I don't know. I just have some cheese. Yeah. Also, <laughs> well, also, the cheat sheet helps so much. And so uh, that's true. Like we get a cheat sheet for our business class, and literally, like the class examples are like the same questions on the but like different numbers. So I just write all the class examples, and then I'm like, just like, oh. and like all the equations. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I put some time to that, but yeah, I do it on the test. Yeah. Oh, that was your like official. Yeah, we can take it. Yeah, just like <laughs> nice. take it whatever you want on a piece of paper. Are you taking the cup paste? Uh, no, just regular. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, I always dread the OPEM midterm and final, but you know, it's, we'll get it over with. Yeah. So the memorization, I'm just I like I'm so good at like switching things up and like makes so yeah. General concepts make sense. It's just piecing it all together. It's tough. But hopefully, it gives us a good practice test. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. Practice term makes the biggest difference. Yeah. Just knowing the structure of like how it is. So many of the textbooks. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know. But yeah, it's weird. Like when I'm sitting in this class, the lecture, like nothing makes sense. And then I go watch the video again, and then I'm like, oh, that would make sense. And, yeah, I get it. and then yeah. the next day I come to class, I'm like, oh, here we are. Again. Back to zero again. I'm like, oh. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm taking like anatomy physiology, and like I feel like there's more stuff to that class than this class. But at least with that class, it's just like memorization. Yeah, like very I straight just straight have to memorize muscle or like something. This like it's memorization, but you also have to like also understand it really to like know how it works with each equation. Yeah, yeah, because you like threw up the other thing that uh also it. Thing that right. takes off the oxygen. Like, toss that right. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, you can just use that. Like, what is that? That's <laughs> like the end of the lecture on this past Thursday. The room specifically was like, oh, I'm not going to do another mechanism today. Oh, yeah. But I think that was it. Yeah. I'm glad we can pull up some good review time. Oh. But yeah, it just bothers me because I'm so. So hit or miss on this material. So like last semester we thought, yeah, but you got that stuff down. Yeah. So, someday I'll get this all down. I don't know if you're not the final. <laughs> One day. Someday. <laughs> Never mind, this was auto oxidation. It's something they do with the oscillate. Was it? Yeah, I don't remember that.
Yeah, sounds familiar. Have we used it before or not? It sounds familiar. I just can't remember. Lex, do the, the running teams have morning practices or what, um, what time are your practices normally? Normally they're from three to five. Three to five. But um, I normally run in the morning on Tuesdays hmm. um, because of our lab. And then right. sometimes like on Fridays, depending on like who has class when, we might right. go in the morning. Okay. I, um, Jackson is in Gen Chem right now. And okay. we're trying to figure out whether or not we're going to keep the Monday, Wednesday lab section. For the third for the third quarter at Gen Chem. And so I'm trying to see if that's the athletes that if it would be helpful to the athletes to have that because we need that about five students in it to make it worth running. Yeah. Um so I was just curious. Well, I think for next quarter, um, we're even having uh practice starting at four mm -hmm. because of something to do with the track. Okay. Because it's not middle school. So gotcha. Oh, they have you run at the at the middle school using that for for that one. Where do you run for cross country? Are you on the Nordic? Were you on the Nordic track or um for cross country we're just anywhere. Any I mean for races. Oh, do you have course. a home oh, um, course? No, we, we haven't hosted anything yet. Oh, okay. Um, I don't really know. I know that a coach has been like looking at different potential race courses, but I don't really know yet. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's get back into some synthesis here. Um, so I'm going to jump back some slides. Our next category. So we we went through all our different functions, not all of them, not exhaustively. We went through some examples of how our functional group transformations can work. So some of them are kind of left off the transforming from one functional group to another. And what we focused on is how do we move where a functional group is? Because moving from one functional group to another, that's actually pretty straightforward, right? That's a, an SN2 reaction handles that pretty well um, for, for most of the functional groups we've talked about so far. So the reactions that are both trickier, but also somewhat limiting um, in are the reactions that change the carbon skeleton. Um, and the reason they're limiting in synthesis is actually not a bad thing necessarily, because otherwise you can wind up with decision paralysis. If you have too many options available to you and you're not sure which one to go with, that can actually make things look more complicated, even though it gives you more freedom. Sometimes having a limited number of reactions is a benefit. And so when we have to change the carbon skeleton, that actually is, we only have really two options, right? We have cleavage reactions, which we really only have one um, that, we've, that we've used consistently, which is the ozonolysis. And then, and this we can pair as well with, with moving a pi bond, right? If we start with a big carbon molecule and we want to make it into a smaller carbon molecule, if we can move the pi bond where we want to cut it and then put it through ozonolysis, that's a pretty powerful tool, right? Yeah, we still wind up with, an, with a carbonyl and we haven't dealt much with what to do with carbonyls after that. Um, but it's a... It's a pretty straightforward process. And actually, I don't know if we need to add. Well, I'll just, I can pick the reactions that I ask you, the synthesis problems that I ask you to do carefully. Um, but the if we wanted to then take one of these products and turn it back and turn it into being an alcohol instead of a carbonyl, we actually have a pretty straightforward process for that. We do a, a reduction reaction. So where we're gonna, where we reduce the number of carbon oxygen bonds. So if we took this molecule and we expose it to sodium borohydride, 
that just takes a carbonyl and it undoes the oxidation. You add a hydrogen, it's kind of like a hydrogenation reaction. You wind up adding a hydrogen to both sides of the pi bond. So then we'd wind up with four carbons and an OH. So we don't have to end at the cleavage step because then once we have our OH group, now we've got another functional group we know what to do with when it comes to moving it around, et cetera. Our other way that we, that we can change the carbon skeleton is an alkylation where we increase the number of carbons. Um, and the most straightforward way we have of doing that is with an alkyne, make that um, alkynine ion, which then can act as a nucleophile. Um, but the other one that we have talked about as well is if you start with a bromide, you can do that Grignard reaction. You can take where we can which was the one where we take brom two bromobutane plus magnesium bromide, or just, no, sorry, plus a magnesium. We make this molecule where we effectively attach the magnesium where the bromine was attacked. It's, it's, the mechanism is very similar to that um, hydroboration mechanism, where you started by basically inserting the carbon in between the boron and the hydrogen. In this case, you insert the magnesium in between the bromine and the carbon, which then makes that carbon into a nucleophile. It gives that carbon a partial negative charge. If you've got something with a partial negative charge, it can act as a nucleophile. So then you could take this molecule, um, and a lot of times we'll just represent it as um, RMGBR, where the R group is the, the carbon, plus another molecule with a good leaving group, like say another bromide, we would wind up attaching the bromine where the bromide, or sorry, attaching the R group where the bromide is. All right, so this is lower yield, but actually more, more powerful way of changing the carbon skeleton of adding carbons together. Um, it's low yield because that Grignard reagent, the magnesium bromide compound that you make is really not very stable and it degrades very, very quickly. But if you can make that and then you turn around and add it to something else that has a good leaving group, it's a really simple way of adding a very specific R group without having to mess around with pi bonds. So we have two tools for alkylation. We only have one tool for cleavage reactions. We have two tools for alkylation. But basically, if you need to remove carbons, it's got to be ozonolysis. It's just a matter of setting it up before the ozonolysis so that you chop it into the pieces you want. And if we need to add carbons, it's got to be either alkanide acting as a nucleophile or that Grignard reagent acting as, as a nucleophile. So you're going to need something with a good leaving group to attach it to. But once you do have that, it's pretty straightforward. You just put your pieces together. You either wind up with the R group from the Grignard reagent attached where the X was, where the halide was, or your alkanide, your alkyne attached. 
Um, the alkyne one is really useful for building molecules from scratch because you can start with acetylene, like we saw some examples of, right? You can start with an acetylene and then you can attach one R group to one side, a different R group to the other side in a really, really simple sequential manner. If you already have two pieces that are close to what you want, then the Grignard reagent works pretty well. Uh, but if you're building something from scratch, the alkanide is, is the way to go. Right, and so this is that, that uh, process that I was talking about before, the retrosynthetic pathway, um, where you start from the product that you're trying to make and work your way backward until you get what you want or get what you start from. Um, the other way of showing this, the ret retrosynthetic arrows would look like it's, it's an open arrow like that, um, is that style of arrow as a reaction arrow means working backward. So that allows you a way to still write from left to right but be working backwards. I find it easier to just do it the way it's shown up above and just start at the right hand and work, work the other way. Um, that way you're not, because it always seems weird to me to be going backwards in time, but left to right. Um, but just so you've seen it, when you see those, those long open arrows, the big open arrow, that's what it means. It means it's a retro synthetic step. All right, so how would we do this this one example? It might not actually be three. It might not actually be four reactions to do that. But how could we go from the OH group at, at the end of the carbon chain to an alkyne at the, in the same position? <coughs> I already just kind of answered this question for you, but do we have to modify the carbon skeleton? Same number of carbons, right? And they're all still attached in the same way. So we don't need, we don't want to move any methyl groups. We don't want to add any carbons, chop any carbons off. So we're just doing functional group transformations. What do we know the last step has to be? To make the alkyne, what do we have to have? Yeah, we have to have that excess sodium amide, right? <clears throat> this wasn't here last week, was it? Okay. Okay. I'm just noticing it for the first time, I guess. <laughs> All right, so we need, we know we have to end with the excess amide, right? So what would, what would the material we started from, what would we add excess amide to? Well, it's double elimination we're trying to do, right? So which we need to have a dibromide to be able to do a double elimination. And they could be on the same carbon or they could be on adjacent carbons. 
what's going to make more sense to put the two bromines on the same carbon or put on on adjacent carbons? And why? Which of those options makes more sense as far as how we're going to make it? Do we have any reactions that add two bromines at the same time? And it puts them on opposite sides, right? So it probably makes more sense to put our two bromines on adjacent carbons rather than the same carbon because we have one reaction that could add both of them at once. So to get there, you just add bromine, right? To what? Do you find that reaction, Lex? Yeah, we did a dibromination that was from an alkene. We added a bromine, it was an addition reaction where we had a bromine to each side of the pi bond. That's like one of the first ones you did. Huh? Mm -hmm. Back when we first did addition, yeah. I only I only called you out because you started flipping through your papers. So I was wondering if you got there yet. I was trying to figure out the organization of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now do we have something, a molecule we could make in one step from our starting material, or do we have to do one more intermediate? Can we make, can we make that from that? An elimination, so we were gonna have to do something to make that OH a good leaving group. But yeah, if we did an elimination reaction, we could get straight from, from that primary alcohol to the alkene. So this is a good example. I like this problem because it's, it's a reaction where you almost have to work backward. It's really hard, especially as, as y'all are just learning this, it's really hard to see these steps sequentially if you don't start at the end and work backward. And again, this is a case where the limitations are helpful. We knew we had to make, make a terminal alkyne, we had to go through this double elimination step. And to get something that we can make that has a dibromide, we had to go through this bromination step, right? The, the limitations kind of rule everything else out. What are the reagents to go for from the alcohol to the alkene? We wanted a strong base, right? But we needed to make the alcohol better leaving group first. So I'm just gonna write them up above so it's not too crowded. Yeah. And then it has the um solvent listed because it needs to be a polar aprotic solvent. And then we follow that with the sodium ethoxide. That's really messy, but showing the same thing we, we had on the previous slide. Does it matter if we do an um, a Zaitsev or a Hoffman product for the elimination? 
Now our leaving groups on the primary carbon. So that's going to put the, the pi bond in the same spot regardless. If our leaving group was on the secondary carbon, we would have to be careful with that. We'd have to make sure we made the, the Hoffman product. Like a hindered. Uh, so in which in that in which case we'd use the sterically hindered base, yes. Finish writing this where we can see it ish. And so just sodium methoxide, sodium hydroxide even would work too. Um, sodium ethoxide is the standard that we see written in all of our, our diagrams, but really any strong base would work. That's like a strong base that's like not sterically hindered, but what's the advantage of that one over just regular hydroxides? Hydroxides can be um, can cause other side reactions. This is not as good as a nucleophile as hydroxide. Um, so it, it tends to, but methoxide would work as well. Um, this is just sort of the, I think it's just common. It's cheap. It's easy to work with. Um, hydroxide. The other issue with hydroxide is that it's hygroscopic, which means that the solid sodium hydroxide will pick up moisture from the air. And so if moisture, if having water will throw off your your reaction series, you tend to want to avoid that. Sodium ethoxide might not be hygroscopic. Um, so that, might, that would be an, another practical reason. And right, so here's here's the solution written a little bit more clearly, but it's exactly what we came up with. They used they did use a sterically hindered base because it's a bad nucleophile as well. I guess if it doesn't matter whether you get the Hoffman or the Zaitsev, you might as well use a sterically hindered base, um, just because then you don't run the risk of any substitution process happening to compete with. Um, but I would it would have been a full credit answer to add, to use the sodium ethoxide as well. If we tried to put both bromines on the same carbon, well, there's not really a good way to do that, is there? Um, short of starting from an alkyne and doing a dibromination, hydrobromination to an alkyne. And if we started from the alkyne, we already got to our final product anyway. So that would have defeated the purpose. That's, um, uh, I don't remember what the U stands for, but both of those are sterically hindered bases. Uh, I don't remember specifically. We would have written T-butoxide because we've been using that one more commonly. All right, so here's two more practice problems. This is all we have left for uh, lecture today is to work on these ones. So I'm thinking we we end lecture officially a little bit early, um, and then we'll we'll start by answering these in lab at one to give it, give everybody a chance to work on these without me in the room because. You know me, I can't help but try to work through them. I can't sit here while you quietly work without doing it for you. Um, but give you a chance to try these ones on your own. And then um, we'll work through them in the beginning of lab at one. 